Thanks, Ben. You guys did a great job. I, you know, we've been our sermon fear. Uh, let me scare you for just a second. Forty-three days until Christmas. Wow. Then, yeah. I mean, woo, right? Well, as I got to look at that number, I began to think about a, a Christmas in our past. When Alex was six years old, I had this bright idea. I'm going to get him an ATV, a four-wheeler. Uh, and I can still remember showing him that four-wheeler on that morning. Janelle and I had found it online, and we had driven up to uh, Kansas City to pick it up. Alex was with us, and we put it in the back of the pickup. He never even knew it was back there. I mean, he's just like oblivious. I don't know what he was thinking. But anyway, we bring it home, we hide it, and, and then on that Christmas morning, it's time to reveal it to him. And, and I can remember... As I, was, as I was handing him the keys, I began to think about uh, the, whenever I had one of my own. And I began to think about all of the wrecks that I had had. And I began to think about uh, all of the pain that I had inflicted upon myself. Uh, and so as I hand him those keys, I offer him this stark warning. And I say, Alex, this thing can kill you. I mean, it can hurt you real bad. And so he's standing there, just kind of like this, and, and, and I just keep hammering away at it, you know. Alex, you can flip it. I mean, you, you, could, you could run it through a fence. You could, you could hit a tree. You could get hit by a car with it. I mean, over and over, I'm drilling it in his head. Be safe, be cautious. This thing will kill you. And I wasn't belaboring the point because I wanted him to be afraid of the machine. I just, wanted, I just wanted him to respect the machine. I wanted him to uh, respect it so that he, in some way he would be preventing himself from injury and harm. The last thing that I wanted to do was make him afraid of it. Uh, I just wanted him to know what the machine was capable of, and I just wanted him to uh, treat it with respect. Apparently, I overplayed my hand a little bit because after I handed him the keys, he goes out, he gets on it, makes one pass around the house, comes back in, hands me the keys, and goes back to play Nintendo. That's the last time he ever wrote it. One time. Wah, wah, wah. I mean, I share that story because I think it's a great analogy to the, this last fear that I want to discuss. Um, you know, over the past three weeks, we've been talking about the fear of the future, the fear of failure, the fear of man. Fear by itself, that is an unpleasant word, isn't it? I mean, when you think about that word fear, we associate it with unpleasant emotions. There are memories where we were afraid that are unpleasant. Uh, and so in each of those three previous fears, God's word is very direct when it, uh, when it talks about them. And in response to those fears, God's word says this, fear not, fear not. And um, basically the idea is all of these fears, that we're, this fear that we're talking about, it's not a big deal. Don't worry about it. You should not be afraid of it. But now in this final week, we're actually going to approach a subject, one of the fears that the Bible actually commands us that we should fear. And all those other ones, it's like, you shouldn't fear failure. You shouldn't fear man. But now the Bible says you are to fear the Lord. Here's what Proverbs 23, 17 says. Don't envy sinners, but always continue to fear the Lord. You see, that right there is an admonition that we should continuously fear the Lord. It's vital to our lives. It is a healthy fear. It's a fear that every day uh, that we are breathing should be present within our mindset. And the Bible states it over and over and over, fear God or fear the Lord, somewhere north of 65 times it says that. But God, believe me, God does not want you to be afraid of him. That's not the intent of those passages. God simply is like the ATV. He wants us to have a healthy respect for him. Or there could be dire consequences. 
And that's why I, I told you that story with Alex, because I didn't want him to be afraid of the machine. I wanted him to have a healthy respect for it because I don't want to spend the afternoon in the ER. And, and so I wanted him to approach it and use it and enjoy it. That's another big thing. I wanted him to enjoy it. And, and complete enjoyment was found when he would respect it. What I did, though, was I created fear, and he never got back on it again, never enjoyed it again, never had all of the experiences and the fun that I did because he was afraid of it. And God does not want us to experience our, our interaction with him in those terms. But you have to understand that as a society that when we lose that fear of God, what ultimately takes place, the result of a lack of fear of God is nothing short of chaos. And it's uh, moral destruction and anarchy. The fear of God is a good thing for us. So if, you, if you're taking notes there on the back of, of your study guide, you'll see number one, I've asked the question, and one of these, I'm going to answer some of these the first question I want to answer is, what does it mean to fear God? And I just want to reiterate, God does not want us to be afraid of Him. He wants us to fear Him. And then whenever, whenever you say that, a lot of times people say, well, what's the difference? Well, in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, there's uh, an event that takes place and God shows up amongst the Israelites and he shows up with smoke and thunder and lightning. And I, and I mean, the earth is quaking and the people realize that God is in their presence and they cry out and they say, don't let God speak to us or we'll die. And then Moses kind of steps up and here's how Moses responds. It's out of Exodus 20, 20. He says this, notice the wording here. Don't be afraid for God has come in this way to test you, and so that your fear of Him will keep you from sinning. Here's, notice, notice that contrast. Don't be afraid, but fear Him. They, there's a difference in those two. They can coexist. There's a difference there. Uh, you see, our understanding of fear is there's an element within this idea of being afraid of a sense of dread. There, there's this anxiety. There's apprehension that comes whenever you face any kind of perceived threat. There's danger. We, we associate it with terror. You see, d fear of itself is a deep-seated emotion that happens in situations that we are fully aware that there could be harm or discomfort. And so it's something that takes place in our psyche, but yet that kind of, of being afraid, that kind of fear also does something to our insides, doesn't it? I mean, have you ever had your gut like knots because of your fear, because you were afraid of something? That type of fear not only affects our psyche, it affects our physical being as well. However, in the Bible, when, when it makes the statement, the fear of the Lord or the fear of God, the emphasis is not on being afraid. The emphasis is more relational. You see, it... it, it what happens with fear is it creates this positive and transformative attitude in us that we are all, all of a sudden aware of God's greatness and, and we begin to align our life with His wisdom and His guidance. That's what the fear of God truly is. And so the fear of God is actually an attitude of, number one, just re reverence and respect. It's, it's how we treat other people. It's, it's, we treat them with reverence and respect. I was reading a story this week of there's a pastor in Georgia. His name's James Merritt. And he was telling the story that he was invited to the Oval Office. The president had invited him there. And as he goes into the Oval Office, he, he said, I was just in, in awe of, of what was going on. He said, I have so much respect for this office. Not necessarily like the physical office itself, but just the aura and, and what that maintaining that office means. And so in, in the midst of it, he, he looked up and there behind the president's desk is a set of bay windows. And he could see in the distance that there was the, uh, the, the rose garden. And so Merritt turns and he looks at one of the staffers, you know, just one of those low-level staffers and says, can I go look out the window? 
You see, that for us, I mean, that's just a little thing, right? But when you have that deep of respect for where you're at and, and you're treated with such reverence, what happens is the little things become big things, don't they? Something as innocuous as taking three steps to look out the window, you recognize that in this place, it demands this attitude from me that I have to ask somebody if I can do that. You see, that's what the fear of God is. It's that reverence and respect. It's the acknowledgement that God is completely different than us. He is set apart from us. He is pure and He is holy. And, and, and it's the fact that I actually hold Him in utmost respect. And I approach Him with caution because His Word says that He is a consuming fire. And I, I know that I don't need to approach that too closely. And the fear of the Lord is an experience. It's the deep emotional response to seeing His power at work. Very similar to working with electricity. I, I'm personally... I call an electrician because I have a deep respect for electricity. You know, just like changing a, a switch on the wall, I mean, the professionals, when you watch how they work, they show electricity respect because they know if they don't, the results could be bad. So what they do, anytime they're just doing anything, just like turn, changing a light switch, They'll go and shut off the breaker box, and when they come back, they'll take the wires and test the wires with a meter. And, and it's not that they're afraid of electricity. They just know that they have to treat it with respect that, because they know the power that they're dealing with. And I'll take that and use that, apply that to how we interact with God. Are you aware of the power you're dealing with? There's also this sense of awe. I mean, have you ever been in the presence of greatness? Uh, I, I, I begin to think about what this looks like in my own life, and I can imagine, what if I was ever caught in an elevator with Michael Jordan? You know, I, I'm sure that I would just be, you know, and he'd probably be looking at me out of the corner of his eyes, is this kid weird or something? He'd probably taking a step over, and I'd just be sitting there staring. I can remember one time my wife and I, had attended a, a fundraiser, and afterward they had Kurt Warner there. And Kurt Warner was walking out the door about the same time that we were. And, and he had just won the Super Bowl. And I was just standing there slack-jawed. And my wife, she just bebops over and introduces herself. And, I mean, she had no fear of him. Me, I mean, it's like, mm, I'm not going to bother them. And that's the same way it happens all the time. Anytime, I don't know if you've ever seen anybody famous at dinner, my wife, she would go up and talk to them and ask for an autograph and all that. And I'm like, mm -mm, I respect them too much to, I resp you know, I'm in awe of that person. I'm dumbstruck whenever I see people like that. That's what it means to be in awe. Anytime you find yourself overcome with wonder and amazement, it's like, it, it, it's like uh, watching the sunrise over the Rocky Mountains, you know, and, and you see the different colors and, and you just sit there in awe of what God has made. I, I find myself at awe a lot of times whenever I, I watch television and I see Olympians conduct and, and, and um, is that me? That's weird. Anytime I see Olympians break records, Michael Phelps breaking records over and over and over again. I begin to think of Sean White. He's a snowboarder. But he's also a skateboarder. I mean, anytime you put this guy on some sort of a board, he wins a gold medal. Nothing stops him. Guys like that, I just am in awe. But that's what awe is. It's, it's an emotion in which there's dread and veneration and wonder, and it's all kind of inter intermingled in this one big ball of just dumbfounded, you know. But also, uh, another way that we can express it is through honor. When you honor someone else, you not only think of them in the highest regard, but you treat them with the respect and esteem they deserve. And it's because of who they are or what they've done. You see, to honor someone is to give them special recognition. That's what we did this morning. We honored our veterans. And, we, and with that, 
we need to interact with them in a very specific and, a, and according manner. So we acknowledge people. We honor them by acknowledging their position. We put them in their proper place. And with regard to God, when we honor God, it's the idea that you say, I know I am not God and you are. That's what it means to show God honor, to put him in his proper place. But another element of fearing God is, is just how it's, this is a way that it's going to manifest itself is you're going to be obedient. It's how it's going to come out is that you will be obedient to him. I mean, if you truly revere and respect the Lord, you will do what he tells you to do and you will do it well to the very best of your ability. And you will do it faithfully. You will do it with no questions and no excuses and you will continue to do it until he tells you to stop. That's what it means to respect and revere the Lord through your obedience. You know, to, to have the fear of God means that, you know, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to be loyal to you, Lord. I'm going to be loyal to your leadership, and I'm, I won't waver. I won't fall back. I won't denounce you. I am steadfast. You see, the fear of the Lord is a combination of all of those. It's, it's the reverence and the respect and the continual awareness of Him and, and the sincere commitment to Him and the honor that we show Him. That's what it means to fear the Lord. But why? The next question I want to answer is why should we fear the Lord? Well, the easy, first one's a super easy one. It's because He commands it. We are to fear God because He commands it. Psalm 34, 11 says this, Come, my children, and listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. Well, why is God so emphatic that we learn to fear Him? The reason is, is because the fear of the Lord is the very foundation of human life. Everything will rise and fall in your own life as you answer this one question, Do I fear the Lord? We see other places in Scripture, that fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Proverbs 1.7 says, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of true knowledge, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. So you, you understand what knowledge is, right? I mean, it, knowledge is the accumulation of information and using it in the right purpose with the right perspective. There are two kinds of knowledge. There, the Bible is very clear about this. There is a knowledge that it says it puffs up or it makes us feel important. 1 Corinthians chapter 8 says, While knowledge makes us feel important, it is love that strengthens the church. You see, there is a form of knowledge that we can have that makes us feel important. But there's also a form of knowledge that leads to godliness or right living. Titus 1.1 says, I have been sent to proclaim faith to those God has chosen and to teach them to know the truth that shows them how to live godly lives. So, two different people can possess the very same information and view that information differently. It's not the same knowledge. Worldly knowledge is always used to the benefit of the possessor. People will use knowledge and they'll use it for their own benefit. They'll use it to acquire money, power, or position. But godly knowledge is completely different. Godly knowledge is a gift from God. Godly knowledge is, is, a, is given to the receptor for the purpose of serving him. You see, so true knowledge, true, I mean, we're talking truth, is information that is viewed through the perspective and the lens of God. When you truly fear God, all the information that you receive on a daily basis. You will filter that, you will glean that, and process that through the lens of how God sees that same information. That's something that our society is truly missing. Because in our society today, the accumulation of knowledge is very popular. People want to be known as very smart. They want to have all of this information. But information received without the proper perspective is just facts and figures. True information is whenever I can receive information and then I begin to look at it and begin to ask the question, okay, God, how do you see this? I want to see it the same way. 
And I want to see it your way because I respect you and I honor you, i.e., I fear you. Yeah, you can be knowledgeable a lot of, about a lot of different things, but if you don't fear God, you are ignorant about the most important thing in life. That is your personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Life isn't about knowing a bunch of figures. Life isn't about knowing a bunch of information. Life is about learning who God is and then living in that perspective. That's what life's about. So life is the beginning of knowledge, but it's also the beginning of wisdom. Proverbs 9.10 says, Fear of the Lord is the foundation of wisdom. Yeah, I'm sure that you're aware of this. You've probably heard this preached about a bazillion times. Knowledge and, inf- and wisdom are not the same thing. Knowledge is information. Wisdom is the application of knowledge. Wisdom is actually knowing what to do, when to do it, and how to do it. Wisdom is also knowing what to believe and what not to believe. That's wisdom. It's another word for discernment. Do you have a discerning soul? Are you, are, do you possess the fear of God that allows you to be able to, to see through the lie? To be able to see what is true and, and what is, is a wolf in sheep's clothing? Do you have that capability? I mean, if you want to be a wise person, the only place, the right place to start is in the fear of the Almighty God. You have to have the right attitude towards Him. That means you must respect Him and revere Him and defer to Him in all things. That's where true wisdom begins. You see, wise people have no problem acknowledging God's sovereignty and His power. And they know that they have to view everything from His perspective and then respond accordingly. That's what wise people do. I know in the back of your mind, sometimes we... we make ourselves believe that God is out to get us or that God is playing games with us. God does not receive any enjoyment from watching us crash and burn. He's not into playing games with us. He wants us to be wise. And when you truly fear the Lord, the only place you will look to for wisdom is God. And the scriptures are very clear. He willingly gives wisdom to anyone who asks for it, anyone who is willing to surrender their life to him, and anyone who is willing to yield to his authority. If you ask for wisdom, he gives it. Just turns the keys to the car over. But the ultimate goal for every single believer should be to glorify the Lord. And any knowledge or wisdom that is not used to that end and for that purpose, it's powerless. That wisdom, that knowledge is simply impotent without the fear of the Lord. Now, number three question here that I want to answer is that what's the outcome? Okay, so when I truly fear the Lord, what will happen? Number one, really simple, and that is that you'll live differently. I've already stated that the fear of God is, is, is the continual awareness that I am constantly in the presence of a holy and, and just and almighty God. Every thought that I have, every word that I speak, every deed that I do is completely open before God. I cannot hide from Him. And every one of those things is being judged by him. Now, not judged like he's punishing me for those things. It's like he's taking note of them, if you will. So if that's true, I mean, if it's true that God, I'm, God is constantly viewing what Jason is doing, and if that was true in your public life, wouldn't every action, word, and deed make a difference to you? Would you change how you live? Wouldn't it change the way that, that you speak? Would it change the fact that how you act or how you treat another person? If, if that's true, shouldn't you fear the Lord even more? I think so. But we're not only living differently because we are aware of His presence. We're living differently because our view of God's trustworthiness 
grows as well. What I mean by that is when you fear the Lord, you recognize that he is all-powerful, almighty. We have a deep respect for him. And that informs the way that I move forward in, in the future. I, I don't have to worry about the what-ifs. I, I don't have to uh, continually be anxious about what life is going to provide for me. I can rest knowing that he loves us. He provides for us. I, I can have confidence in his promises. Proverbs 14 says this, Those who fear the Lord are secure, and he will be a refuge for their children. The next very, very next verse says, Fear of the Lord is a life-giving function. Fountain. It offers escape from the snares of death. And so, that's the first thing. Your view of the world, though, changes and your priorities change, too. I hope you realize that. When you fear the Lord, you'll experience this life-changing or life-giving transformation. You'll begin to see things the way that God sees them. You'll begin to care about the things that God cares about. And all of a sudden, your priorities shift dramatically. You begin to recognize that God has, is in control and He's always been in control and He always will be in control and, and no matter how forcefully you try to, uh, try to make it different or no matter how forcefully the world tries to convince you otherwise, the truth is that God is sovereign and He is faithful. And when you wrap your brain around that, the way you look at the world changes and, and the, the things that are important to you are no longer important to you. But I think it will also, one of the things that I, I really appreciate about the fear of the Lord is it changes how I worship. Whenever I fear the Lord, I worship Him the best. You know, last fall, Janelle and I took a road trip up to Alberta, Canada, and we went to Banff National uh, Forest in Alberta. And as we began to travel north out of Banff, uh, we stopped at one particular place and got out and you could literally walk out on a glacier. And I can remember looking up, seeing where that glacier, you could see where that glacier had come down and how it was receding and how it had carved a valley in this mountain. And then there were other places in the park where you could see how glaciers that had left had left behind deep lakes and the water was just crystal blue. And the waterfalls, in one place, there's just waterfall after waterfall of the snow melt. And, and I mean, it's just roaring. The water was just roaring. And when you see that kind of thing up close, when you see those things firsthand, you know, even someone with a hard heart like me is just in awe. I just, I just felt a sense of wonder because when you're in the presence of this glacier, you can't help but be amazed at the power of the creator of that thing. And, and so that's, those are the type of experiences that prompts us to wonder and worship. It increases the depth of our reverence for God. And whenever that depth of reverence for God increases, naturally how you worship Him will change. You, you will enter into a deeper level of worship. The sincerity of your worship increases because we are beginning to see God for who He truly is. We're experiencing His power, His creativity, His longevity. Those glaciers have been there a very long time. God set all that in motion, and, and when that happens, I begin to understand and put God in His rightful place. That's what worship is, putting God in His rightful place. And I think it's because we begin to see just how truly small we really are. We see how small we really are in contrast to this holy God. That's what Isaiah experienced in Isaiah chapter 6. When Isaiah is transported to the throne room, he sees the Lord seated on the throne with, with all these heavenly beings around him and he is overwhelmed by the majesty and he falls to his knees and he says woe is me I am no match for the creator of the universe kill me now you see God's holiness 
it clearly reveals just how insignificant Isaiah is. And then he falls in worship. That's what worship is, is putting God in his right place. And when God is your king, when he is the ultimate ruler, you will regard him as such. You'll continue to worship him accordingly. You'll treat him differently. And, and, and I just want for you personally, just take a moment for me. And I want you to think in your mind about your own personal depth of worship. I think because when you begin to see, how did I sing this morning? Did I just mouth the words? Was my mind somewhere else? Was I, was I uh, thinking about something else? Was I occupied with another thought? You see, lackluster worship is an indicator that you might not truly fear God like you should. Another thing that fearing the Lord does is it keeps us from evil. I mean, let's face it, every single one of us in here deal with sin at some level. We all have struggles. The Proverbs 3, 7 says, Don't be impressed with your own wisdom. Instead, fear the Lord and turn away from evil. So those struggles that you constantly deal with, I mean, the, the pride and the lust and the bitterness and the gossip and the worship or the worry and the greed, all of these sins that we constantly battle with. But when you truly fear the Lord, you will not want those things in your life anymore because you know He's God and I'm not. He's all-powerful. He's all-knowing. He has the power to crush me. And what He says is truth and I should obey it. And for me, it's the idea that of going, God, I respect you so much that even though this desire is very strong right now, I respect you so much, I refuse to give in to that desire, and I will instead choose to follow you. That's how the fear of the Lord keeps us from evil. When your desires assail you and convince you you need to do this, you will reject that temptation because your only desire is His righteousness. And the life that is constantly lived in the fear of the Lord is a life of holiness. It's a life of righteousness. You refuse to give in to anything that would cause him to receive disrespect. Solomon writes this, he says, Unfailing love and faithfulness make atonement for sin, but fearing the Lord, people avoid evil. So just like... Alex, having that healthy respect for an ATV, I, I intended it to, to prevent this catastrophic event. The fear of the Lord does the same thing. Keeps us from committing some catastrophic sin that can absolutely destroy the lives of you and everybody around you. And so fearing the Lord causes us to live in such a way that we will not want to give in to the evil. And we can escape the snares that leads to spiritual destruction. Proverbs 22, true humility and fear of the Lord leads to riches, honor, and long life. Proverbs 19 says, fear of the Lord leads to life, bringing security and protection from harm. Now, I think I've presented a pretty convincing uh, points here. But the truth is that every single person has a duty to fear the Lord. King Solomon wrote about this in the book of Ecclesiastes. You'll remember the book of Ecclesiastes. That's the book where he was talking about how he had tried everything under the sun. Nothing was withheld from him. If he wanted it, he took it. He, and he experienced all that life had to offer, nothing off limits. And at the end of his search, here's what Solomon has to say about all of that. Ecclesiastes 12, 13, he says, that's the whole story. Now here's my final conclusion. Fear God and obey His commands, for this is everybody's duty. Fearing the Lord is everybody's duty. The problem is that we aren't born with a natural fear of God. I, you'll remember, I just read earlier, all of us have to learn to fear the God, fear of the Lord. Come, my children, listen to me, and I will teach you to fear the Lord. 
And you can learn to fear the Lord in two ways. There's two things that if you constantly do, you will develop a deeper fear and appreciation and respect for the Lord. The first thing is you have to be reading His Word. Constant interaction with God's Word makes us more aware of just how truly awesome He is. But not only do you have to read God's Word, you have to do what it says. So the more time that you spend in God's Word, the more aware you become of how truly awesome He is. You will develop a deeper respect for Him. You'll begin to understand His ways. You'll begin to model your life after His instructions. That's how that works. And some of you all aren't being exposed and allowing yourself to develop the fear of the Lord because you don't spend any time in God's Word. Maybe some of you all should. Maybe it would bring you to that point where you would just sit there realizing that you are in the presence of an awesome God. You see, because when you truly fear the Lord, God's pleased. Psalm 147 says, The Lord's delight, the Lord delights in those who fear Him, those who put their hope in His unfailing love. You get that? When you fear the Lord, when you show Him respect, honor, when you, when you acknowledge His awesomeness, He's delighted in you. You know what don't del- He doesn't delight in, though? He doesn't delight in those who do not fear Him. And that's the charge today. That's really the responsibility that I'm trying to fulfill at this very moment, and that is to bring you to this point where you have to set in your mind Am I going to fear the Lord or am I not? There's some of you that think that you can do life on your own and that you're wise enough and you possess possess enough information and that you're a good person and that God will allow me into heaven because of this. You, you, you You never show the Lord reverence. You never show the Lord any respect. You go about your life and, and just kind of, the Lord is an afterthought. The scriptures are very clear. Only those who fear the Lord will enter into heaven. And so I want to bring you to that point this morning of, of just considering. If, if, if I was interviewing God right now, would God say, Jason fears me? Some of y'all would be on the wrong side of that question. So I want to implore you. If you do not have a personal relationship with Christ, if you do not fear God, if God's awesomeness never is continually residing within your mind, it's time that you get that right. Otherwise, I think that you will find that God is rather displeased. And I don't think I would want to be on the opposing end of that equation. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for the love you show us through your son, Jesus Christ. When you sent him to die a gruesome death at Calvary, Lord, whenever you piled all the sins of humanity for all time upon your son, it was so gruesome and ugly and deplorable, Lord, that you turned away. And Lord, I am mindful about my own personal sin and how I contributed to that ugliness. Lord, and I recognize that with with the... with just one flick of your finger, Lord, or one idea in your mind, I could cease to exist. Today is a gift for me. I am here by your grace. Lord, and I am grateful for the forgiveness that you've extended to me and how you've washed away my sins, my sins in the past and the sins that I presently have and the sins that I have in the future. Father, but my heart is burdened for those who do not have that forgiveness, that have not experienced the grace that comes along through salvation. And Lord, I pray for them this morning. I pray that if there's anybody in here this morning that that does not have that personal relationship with you, Lord, that you would burden their heart. Lord, that you would drive them to their knees and they would seek your face this morning. Lord, you're an awesome God. You are almighty and you are holy. You are completely set apart from us and you are due all of the honor, respect, and worship we can muster. May your name forever be praised. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Hi. 
Thank you for watching. If you want to see more great content like this, like and subscribe to our YouTube channel. Don't forget to ring the little bell to be notified when we add new videos. Since our founding in 1877, our goal here at Arnhart has been to create God-centered teaching available for everyone, regardless of their status or station. Today, that looks like making trustworthy Bible teaching available to everyone, even if they don't make it to a church building on Sunday. So for more information, check out our website at arnhart.org or join us live on Facebook Sundays at 1045 a.m. As always, we love you and hope to see you next Sunday.